Hey guys, today we're going to be going over the housing system in our cage, as well as getting you ready for the land grab. So first off guys, we'll start by going over what is housing. Housing is these areas on the map identified by a little house icon, where players can place various types of buildings and farms for various proficiency tasks, or simply to just store items and furniture and decorate as they wish. But before going over why you'd need housing and what you'd use it for, we should probably talk about how to actually get land in the first place. So it all starts off with your 8x8 and 16x16 quests, which will get you these scarecrow farm designs. As you can see, mine are already placed. But you basically get these and you place them in a similar manner to I can do with this house here. So you get a house design and you can see there's these areas that are fenced in. Now if I can find an open spot here somewhere, probably should have prepared for this beforehand. Uh, I can see there's some back there, so let's just sprint over here. So you can see these fenced in areas where people have built all their plots and placed their land. You can see the space here for this 16 by 16 cottage, so it doesn't light up red. It allows me to actually see what it would look like here. You'd click it, you can rotate it in all the different ways, things like that, and see what it looks like. Click it again, and it comes up with this window telling you the base deposit tax, how many buildings you own, the tax for the week, and then what you need and the deposit to place it down. Now, as you can see, it says high tax buildings own seven, and that's going to increase my tax rate because the base tax is 10. So it times that by that to get your weekly tax rate. And that is due to owning multiple buildings. So if we go back over here, uh, you can see I own not that farmhouse. I own this farmhouse here, I also own that cottage, that farmhouse, that farm, and that farm, and I own a building all the way down here in the house here on a golf, which you can see on the map there. And that's purely for testing, just seeing what works where and things like that. But the more buildings you own, the more tax it takes, and you only get 65 tax certs uh, from your two quests. So realistically, you're going to be capped on what you can place on release by your tax certs. The way you get more tax certs is by going to a placed farm. It can be anyone's farm. It doesn't have to be public. You can craft bound tax certs right here. As I'm aware right now, this is the only way you can get tax certs unless they're still in the diligence store, which I'm not sure if they are or not. I will double check that really quick. They are. So if you're able to get diligence prior to um, landlock, you can buy some extra tax certs in here. However, uh, that looks like it's one per 10 diligence. So uh, it's not going to really help you out there because I do believe base property tax is like 10. So that, you, you're not really going to have to worry about that before landlock. So you need to get, you can do whatever you want with your 65 you get, but you are going to need to place a scarecrow to make more if you want bigger buildings or more buildings. So let me run back up here and I'll demonstrate exactly what you what happens when you've placed a new building design. So for your 8x8 you will need one lumber. It gives you this lumber to build it immediately so that's fine. With your 16x16 16 16, you need a lumber pat which is 100 lumber so that's going to take you a while but if you're prepared you only have to go and take your lumber to the crafter, build a lumber pack and then build your house or you can potentially have one stage ready to go depending on how packed your housing area is going to be. But we'll see. We put the design down here. I have tons of tax certs, so this isn't a problem for me. I place it down, and it appears like this. Now, with this, I can't do anything. I can't place any trees here, any plants here, because it's not built. So you'll see here, it shows me information. It shows what I need to build it. The tax isn't paid. And here you can see you spend 25 labor and one stone pack to construct the building. So we need two stone packs of this and a lumber pack. Now, I'm not going to build this on video because it's going to take time for no real reason. It's not going to help you out any more than saying what you need to do. But essentially each pack is a hundred of the material. So for this it would be a hundred stone. Uh, in fact I actually believe it's a hundred stone brick. So it's 300 raw stone. Lumber you need a hundred lumber for a lumber pack. And then iron packs if you need iron packs is a hundred iron ingots. As I'm showing you sturdy iron but I don't have my iron ingots on me right now they're in my warehouse. But once you've got your land placed Basically, you're able to plant trees and plants and livestock and things like that on them. You can see I've got some turkey chicks here and I can place them just like this. 
there's a setting in your settings uh, that allows you to basically get squids. You can see it sort of tries to align itself. You can turn this off, but really this makes planting things a lot easier just to drag and get your, your items as close to each other as they can. But you see, you place like this, you just place chicks along things like that. You can get animal pens, you can get bundles of plants later on at higher proficiencies. And you can also upgrade certain buildings like these upgrades, upgraded farmhouses here, which have patches to plant 50 seeds on at once. I think they're slightly less efficient as single planting, but it's a lot less time and a lot less work for, for uh, the materials needs. Rather than planting single handedly 50 seeds, I can just plant 50 in one of these beds. One thing I want to show you guys is an example here. If I if I get my house out and see the designs, you can see there's a lot of wasted space here. And the reason people do this sort of stuff, and you'll see this on Landlock, is in order to essentially preserve that land. So what people will do is they'll place their land like here, and then you could fit another another building here, but they'll cut into it slightly. And that's so at a later date, they can move their land over and place another building down. So it's basically using a smaller size plot to secure a larger area. And you'll see that a lot. People will place their eight by eights in the middle of a spot that would support 16 by 16 in order to try and save and preserve that 16 spot for a later date. So that's something you need to be aware of at Landlock is maximizing the amount of space you can gather with your house. Personally, it is kind of a dick move but other people are going to do it, so you should try and do it first. You should try and get as much land as you can for as little as you can. So, I've already told you you get your 8x8 and your 16x16 16 16 farms from quests. But the rest of your land will come from here in Mirage Isle, or over on the other side of the map where the Harani buildings are. But we're starting over here because this is probably where your most and second most important housing styles are for the landlock. Most important will be this one here, your 16 by 16 cottage. As the name suggests, it's 16 by 16 in size, so it's not a massive cottage, and it won't cost you massive amounts of tax certs. The second big thing about this is it's only 15 guilder. So pretty much everybody is gonna be able to afford one of these come landlock. And you'll see most people try and place two of one of these, their 16 farm and their eight by eight before going for anything else. So you wanna keep an eye on getting one of these if you know you're not going to go for a bigger house or you know you won't be able to afford it definitely pick one of these up ready for landlock as we also discussed earlier you can use a 16 spot like this to secure more land than it takes up especially when combining it with your other two farms you can likely secure enough space for a 24 by 24 uh, with just the three buildings even though they don't equal that size on to the second most important type of building, it's your manor houses. So you've got this one here, the one with the second floor, which is 300 guilder, and this one here without the second floor for 200 guilder. Now, 200 guilder is definitely achievable before landlock if you do your dailies. So is 300 in theory, but it'll be a lot more difficult. So most people will probably be looking at these for their 24s. The reason these are important is not only because they're 24 by 24, but also because you can upgrade these into certain types of manners, including things like the Tradesman's Manor, which allows you to craft specialty packs directly from the manor. Now onto the next few houses, these ones you will not see, I can guarantee around uh, landlock time because they're way more expensive, 400, 500 guild or a lot of these, but they are a lot bigger and a lot nicer including these ones on the other side here, which can be way more expensive, like 800 guild or up to possibly 1,000. You can see these ones are 500. They do look nice, but you will not get that many guild of stars for the landlock, but they are worth considering if you want a spot later, especially considering they're bigger, can store more items, and will go in luxury housing spots, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. After your basic housing, you've pretty much got your mansions uh, these ones here, 1000 guilder, not too expensive when you think of other designs like the car designs and things like that. Definitely expensive to build, but I mean, you're definitely going to stand out. And you'll likely recognize the building design from the design of the community centers in the open world of the game. And now these obviously are 44, I believe, 44 by 44. I will double check that. And they can, they can store way more items in them than 
the other housing. That being said, if you look at the actual space that you'd think would be in it from the outside, it hasn't got a ton of floor space compared to what it could have. But this is not the biggest and best building in the game by far. <laughs> oh no, this one over here would be the most expensive and best building in the game at 3000 Gilder Stars. I'm not too sure on the sizing of this one. I will just check it. I think it might be 48 by 48. No, it's also 44 by 44, so it's not that bad. But you can see how fancy this one looks. You'll, you'll definitely not see any of these for a very long time, and most people won't waste the Gilder on these. But if you do manage to get one, you'll definitely be the rich kid in your housing zone, I can assure you that. But look how fancy this these houses. Obviously, it doesn't come furnished like this. This is all people furnishings people have bought, and you can obviously come in here and buy things like the piano design and things like that. But... It will come bare bones, but it's still a very, very fancy house. Very, very nice house. And uh, I dare say some people may end up going for these houses. The other type of building on this side is the plaza. Now, these are useful. Um, you used to be able to craft fellowship packs on these. I'm not sure if you still can. But these do come with various merchants and crafting benches and things like that on them. So they are nice to have in community areas where... There isn't a bench. For example, down in House Yona Gulf, where I have my other house, there aren't many merchants, or there aren't any merchants, and there's only a couple types of workbench. So a plaza down there would be really, really nice. You can also get um, little workbenches that you can place down for land areas. However, most of the actual housing zones will have all the necessary crafting benches and things like that. So they're not too important um, unless you're in somewhere like Aurora around a castle and things like that but they're right there you can technically use these for landlocking as well um, I'm pretty sure they're pretty cheap I'll double check that I think they're like five or ten guilder 30 okay well I was way off but they're still pretty cheap um, they are only eight by eight so you could potentially get two 16s and two eight by eights and try and secure a 24 error but uh, not a lot of people will go for those I don't think but we'll head over now to the Harani side of the land and I'll show you the farmhouse and the building styles on the Harani side. There's not a massive difference to the Harani buildings, it's literally just their appearance. But some people do like the different style um, and it especially can stand out when most people just go for the Nuian styles because there's more variants and more colours in those themselves. But first off on our right you can see the thatched farmhouse design. Now these are great. They're 24 by 24. You can see the house itself is smaller than the 24s on the other side. But that's because it, most of the land here is plantable, farmable land. Look at all the plants that are around this house to demonstrate. Now these are 300 guilder, so they're pretty expensive. But again, 300 guilder is possible before landlock if you try and do every single guilder daily and things like that you can do. I think you can earn like 339 um guild or something like that before landlock so you can get one of these i'm going to be trying to get one of these myself whether it happens or not we'll see but keep in mind those are available and you can upgrade these as well i should talk you can upgrade these into things like a hundred husbandry farmhouse um you saw earlier i had one with an animal pen in it i had one with the um plantable spots and there's also a miners one as well that has mineable rocks on the house so they can be upgraded as well to help with proficiencies and things like that. They can be very useful. But now looking at the Harani style of housing. So you have your 16 by 16 cottage here. Your basic 24. You have another, the two story one over here. You can see there's definitely not much variance on this side. The prices are the same as they are on the new inside. They just look different. And I haven't spoken about tree houses yet, so we'll come over here. Now Now we're not by the tree houses. We'll talk about tree houses. Tree houses are 800 guilder. They're pretty expensive, but they're also really, really good. The housing space isn't huge in terms of where you actually have a house and you can put furniture and things. You can on these platforms, but up top, it's basically like a 16 by 16. The big point about these, far, the, these houses is you can plant underneath them and you can harvest the trees as well. I believe there's a chance for the trees to go thunderstruck every now and then. And most people will get the cherry tree because you can harvest cherries from them. And cherries are usually quite valuable. So obviously, again, you're not going to see these at landlock. But 
you will see people try and save up and go for these tree houses. They're 28 by 28, I believe. I'll double check. Yeah, 28 by 28. But these are things people will want to go for and save for. Probably more than more so than the 1,000 and 3,000 manners you'll see people going for the tree houses. So there's one more type of housing and one more type of farm I want to talk to you guys about, and that is your bungalows and your aqua farms. So these are your bungalows. They're also on the other side. You can see them over there. Um, these are your bungalows. The basic one costs 300 guild again, so it is possible. And the reason these are important is because down here in the water, you've got land you can farm things like corals and pearls and shag and sand, which are obviously used for making pigments and polishes and different types of alchemy stuff. So you will see people probably try and go for these for that reason. If you can get into the coral market quite quickly, that's very good. That being said, a lot of people will just go for aqua farms over these types of housing because aqua farms are cheaper and you don't really need the housing space. There is also a bigger size uh, of the bungalow, which is 500 guilder here. But uh, yeah, most people will go for the aqua farms and these can be placed in special waterside types of land. I can't see them on the map from here, but I know there's one for sure down here in Solace. Basically, you'll see that little housing area uh, symbol just off the coasts of certain areas in the water. And that's where you can place things like your aqua farms and your bungalows. Now, to finish off, I want to talk about the couple of, there's a couple of different types of land. And I also want to talk about why you put your land in certain areas. So as for the types of land, you can see here, if I hover over this, it says these plots are zoned for any type of house or field. This means zones like this, you can literally place any size of house, eight by eight farms, 16 by 16 farms, manors, everything like that, big mansions, you can place it in these zones. There are other zones, like the one where my house, the owner golf house is down here, which unfortunately don't display as housing zones on the map. This is where game knowledge comes in useful. These areas are called luxury zones. And it means basically you can only place certain types of housing there that is considered luxury. This tends to be housing that at minimum is 24 by 24 in size and is not a farm. However, in some of these zones you can place farmhouses. There are also other types of land areas in those zones that are strictly for the 44 by 44 mansion types. That's the only land that can be placed there. So you will not see those land spots get taken up quickly and TP people start getting those. One of those spots is in Halcyona Gulf. I believe there's a couple other island spots for it and there are spots like that on the on uh, the map as well. But if you know you're going for a 24 by 24 at landlock and you're worried that someone's going to try and, you know, or someone's going to take up enough, too much space in your area and things like that, you can try and find one of these luxury zones and the only way then you won't have enough space for a 24 by 24 is if somebody actually gets there first and places their land in the exact same spot. Now as for where you want land, the main reason for where people place land used to be trade packs. So people would place land to things like mermaids tier here because you could craft packs here, load up a trade ship here and go all the way up to Cinderstone, no worries. People also used to do it on Yenistir tip right here they'd have a tradesman's manor here they'd load up right on this tip into a merchant ship and just go south uh, north to Friedrich. you'd also see people come to this island here in uh villanelle to do things like staging packs so they'd run packs from say rock Harlow all the way out to villanelle they'd then stage them on their farms here waiting for someone with a merchant ship to pick them up and take them across the ocean this isn't as important now because we've got the new trade system in place where you can you have to buy cargo from certain areas. Trade packs have a deteriorating value so you won't see people staging hundreds of packs. That being said, for land to land runs, it's still important if you want to do things like cheese packs, honey, things like that. Because for example, uh, if I did two crowns cheese packs to cinderstone the value would be very low because i'm just taking it to here whereas if i did animar cheese packs all the way up to souls read the value would be higher because there's longer distance that being said i don't believe people will be doing that many of these specialty growth packs like cheese honey because gilder packs are way more value so the the land really isn't that much of a problem because you can just come to the zone and craft those packs 
However, it is useful to have farms and housing in the zone you're crafting packs because you can gather your own mats and things like that close to where you need to craft the packs. But that only really matters if you're going to be growing your own mats. Obviously, a lot of people will just buy the mats off the auction house. Now, in relation to growing mats, the temperature and climate of the zone is important. So, for example, here in Animar, this is a temperate zone. You can see that on the map down here. Somewhere like Sandy, for example, is classified as a tropical zone. And if you go into Aurora, somewhere like Diamond Shores, you've got zones in here that are subarctic, tropical, and arid. Now, these are important because different types of plants will grow quicker in different climates. So, for example, if we go into here and just pick, say, the bay sapling, the climate there is temperate, so in a temperate zone, these will grow faster. So for the most efficiency, you want to be planting things that suit that zone. So if you're going to be farming cactus, you're going to want an arid zone. If you're going to be farming um, things like grapes, you're going to want a temperate zone, I believe. I'm trying to remember that off the top of my head. Um, but you ba basically, you want to pick the zone that suits the things you're going to be planting and farming. Now, there is a third factor to picking land zones, and I'm excluding Aurora because I'll come to that in a moment. This one's harder to know ahead of time unless you're a player that's played a lot and know where people want to get land, but it involves your community centers and residents in your area. So if you own a, a piece of land in your area, you become a resident. With that, you can hand in blue salt bonds to your construction, to your community center here like this. See, 10 labor and one blue salt bond to develop. So I've done that there. I'm just gonna, I, they're all in my warehouse, I can't do it. And this will level up your community center. Once your community center reaches level three, you start getting paid every certain period of time. I've forgotten exactly what that period of time is. It's either a week or like 15 days or something like that. Um, but you start getting paid based on your contributions. So if I go into here and go into residence, you see I've now got 10 contribution because I just handed in one blue salt bond. Every resident in the zone can hand in however many blue salt bonds they earn and as much as they want to earn diff uh, differing amounts of contribution. Now, every type of sale and things like that in the zone, every time you spend money at a merchant, the community center gets a portion of that money. It goes into this community of service fees total here. Now, when your community center reaches level three and then in certain periods after that, this money is split amongst all the residents in that zone based on their contribution. So for example, what you'd do is you'd add up the contribution here. So 10, 10, 10, that's 30, 60, and 80 here. And then you take that and you say, okay, so 100% is 80 contribution. So if I've done, you know, 20, if I've done 10%, I'm going to get 8% of that pot. This guy here is going to get 16% of that pot. And it works like that. So obviously the more active your zone is in terms of players and people contributing, the higher this total is going to be. Now, you can try and play it smart and pick an area where people are doing things but not contributing, so you get a higher percentage. Or you can do an area that's more busy and people are contributing, you'll get less of a cut, but the pot total will be higher. And you'll reach your community center rank 3 quicker. But that is a good way to earn reasonably passive gold from the air, just from the area you live in, just from people buying things from the merchant and doing things in your zone. Some areas that will be popular for things like that will be Animar. Animar is where it's one of the best pack zones on the west side. You'll see a lot of people um, around here doing packs and buying things and things like that. So Animar is going to be very good for that. Um, I believe areas such as Sandeep will also be good for that. People doing packs across the ocean same as your coastal regions things like Cinder, cinderstone and two crowns on the east side you'll likely see high rates in areas like yinisteer rock harla sunbite things like that where people will be playing a lot and basically contributing the most buying things the most things like that so those areas i say will have the best pot in community centers so now we're on to the aurora land 
And the two zones that will have land immediately in Aurora are Diamond Shores and Golden Ruins. Now, these used to be very, very important because of things like braziers and Archeum Trees. Braziers obviously used to give you re uh, gems for regrade scrolls. That's not so important now because regrading has fallen out of favor with the synthesis. However, people will still want the flaming logs from braziers and they're still going to want the Archeum and the Archeum logs from the trees. Now, the reason people take this land for it because, is because you've got to get the water and you've got to get the uh, logs to, to fuel those things from these zones here. So, for example, Calmlands and Markala is where you get your uh, trees, your flaming logs from, your burning logs. Uh, and then things like places like Numari and Hedemari is where you get your water from. And it's easier just to boat these across the Diamond Shores or to Golden Ruins. So... A lot of people used to rush this land for that reason, for things like braziers. It's quick and early money. It won't be, I don't believe, in this version, but people still will want land here. You can get land here and you can get land here um, for things like the Archeum trees and flaming logs. So if you're into that and you want to do those things, you can and should get land in Diamond Shores or Golden Ruins. The other zones where housing can be bought, or not bought, but gotten in Aurora, is the castle zones. Once a castle was built, you can build land around the castle. Now, the way this used to work on the old castle system is the guild leader could control who was in those zones. You could, he could actively kick people out of those zones, so often the guild would get priority. He could tax the amount he wants for the land. With the new faction guild castle system, or the new faction castle system, I'm not 100% sure how this works, but land should still be available around the castle. It's likely it's now controlled by the heroes and it's based around faction land, not guild land. But you can get land in these zones. And once they open up, the whole logs and water to Diamond Shores and Golden Ruins tactic will be much less profitable because you'll have land directly in the zones where those logs and things like that are. So that's one thing to keep in mind if you're going for the Diamond Shores or Golden Ruins land. But most people, especially most new players, will be interested in the mainland uh, areas. Places to do trade runs or just to farm uh, or just to have land that looks nice. So to finish up, I want to talk about the areas people will want to place land if they just care about appearance and living in a nice, fancy, pretty area. They don't care about where the best trade run routes are. You know, the people categorized as RPs and things like that. They just want a nice big pretty house and a nice big pretty zone that they can relax in. Obviously, Animar here is a very pretty zone. However, it's going to be very popular among people that actually want to do various proficiency tasks. So it's not going to be... I, I, say, I was going to say it's not going to be easy to get land here as someone that just wants land to look good. It will be pretty easy, but people will be, probably be pretty mad at you uh because they could use that land for actual purpose but areas that specifically look good and look nice areas like house on a golf down here the luxury housing that's a really nice area it's difficult to get to it's not practical it's not useful but it's very nice it's a small little cluster of islands down here you know it's very open it's on the water you can fish from down here it's a very good fishing spot down here actually um you know, you can just stand on the beach and fish and build your mansions and be amongst other mansions. The islands on Castaway Strait are also very popular for just appearance sakes and things like that, especially now that staging packs is completely irrelevant. Um, I believe also areas like Air and Rock can look pretty nice in the nice snowy mountains and things like that, things like that. or McCradle with the train system running through it. Um, as for the, the eastern side, places like Rockhala and Hazar is very pretty. Um, places like Paranor can be quite nice. I don't particularly like Paranor myself, but it can be quite nice. Same, same as Rookborn. Um, but you've areas like Rockhala up here and Hazar, they look good uh, to have housing, things like that in. There's a couple other spots that aren't necessary to look good, but are very important and of worth. And that is Kraken Island and bone island so bone islands over here kraken island i believe is this one here and the reason it's called kraken island is because kraken spawns somewhere around there 
And so guilds tend to rush this land in order to have a quick respawn point or teleport point to Kraken. This island often fills up quite quickly, especially if a guild spawns in like here, rushes it quickly, takes all the land in, uh, and then they go Bone Island over here. Um, but those two islands there, technically you could use as an RP or someone that just wants to have a nice bit of island land that looks nice, but um, big guilds are going to be after that land a lot. So that pretty much wraps up all I have to talk about housing. If I've missed anything, I do apologize and feel free to point it out in the comments. If you do have any questions, you know, feel free to ask them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, I have a, a guide on the various vehicle types coming out likely later today or tomorrow. Um, and I may have a video on starting tips coming out before release if I have enough time. That being said, if you want to keep up to date with everything I'm doing and see more from me, please do hit that sub button. Um, and, you know, I just want to state again, if you have any questions, no matter if it's related to the video or not, please do feel free to ask them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. I've been answering people's questions uh, whenever I see them as best I can. But until next time, guys, please do enjoy the rest of your day and uh, I'll see you in the next video. And hopefully I see you at launch as well. Take care, everyone.